Um, but I want to go ahead and uh, introduce Aiden. I'm really excited to hear this presentation. Let me just tell you a little bit about our fantastic guest speaker. Um, speaker, author, and educator Aiden Key's work centers on gender diverse children. Key, the founder of Gender Diversity, works nationally with hundreds of K-12 schools and youth-based agencies providing professional development, strategic planning, policy development, athletic guidance, which is so important, and education for parents and students. Transfamilies.org, we will put that in the chat for you, also founded by Key, is a national organization providing support and resources for families of gender diverse children. Key is the author of the seminal book, Trans Children in Today's Schools, which I just got my copy of. I'm so excited to dig in. Um, and we will also put that in the chat and a contributing author to both editions of the anthology Trans Bodies, Trans Cells. Aiden was named Community Leader of the Year by the Greater Seattle Business Association in 2017 and Seattle Magazine's Most Influential People of the Year in 2019 and whose media appearances, wait for it, include the Oprah Winfrey Show, oh my, Larry King Live, Diversity is and NPR's Fresh Air. So let me pass it over to Aiden. Right on. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that um, uh, intro. And uh, like Judy said, I don't know. I also feel like the need to take a deep breath. The um, gosh, the journey um, with respect to this work has been step by step, uh, decade by decade. Um, and what, when I hear all of that work encapsulated in that way, it's harder for me to relate to it. But when I when I think about it in terms of gosh, what do I do when I show up in rooms with other humans? Um, essentially, I work to what? I think to be a bridge in terms of understanding. Uh, my first efforts in my first forays, I should say, into K through 12 schools um, over 15 plus years ago now, I just pep talk myself. I just said, you have to know just a little bit more than them about the gender component. They're going to know tons about how to engage in the in the classrooms. They're going to have a sense of how to manage certain certain conversations and at what ages. And I found that as I stepped in with them, I'm busy uh, learning, drinking from the fire fire hose, as they say. Um, and then they would ask questions, and I thought, wow, okay, so here's that question. Oh, here's another question, and they weren't questions that children would ask. They are questions that adults ask. Um, and that could be as personal as, you know, Aiden, what are you gonna say to these children if they ask you if you've had genital surgery? You know, I remember hemming and hawing and trying to figure out, oh my gosh, you know, how would I answer that question? Uh, would the kids ask that question? And I fumbled my way through some answer. And then another question, similar, similar variety showed up and, and, in that moment, I just, I had my own little light bulb go off and I thought, you know what? And this is what I said to this teacher. I said, I have to say respectfully, this is your question. The children aren't gonna ask me that. And judging by the blood rising to her face, I think I was right on. And she pulled it way back and she says, okay, got it. <laughs> um, let's move on and talk about kids. So again, back to that word bridge, bridging the conversations between us as adults uh, of various uh, generations. Um, and then where are the kids themselves? Uh, 15 years ago, I don't know that children were having those conversations in classrooms. Today, uh, gender identity differences are definitely showing up, including people naming and claiming their own gender identities. Uh, and they're, these kids are a bit mystified that the adults don't get it. Um, so again, bridging, bridging. So on that note, I want to share with you something that will likely make a lot of sense to most, if not all of you. And I wanna, I wanna show it to you so that you understand, so that I can share with you why I do this. And um, here we go. <clears throat> with, this is stepping right, you know, midway into the PowerPoint that I bring to pretty much every every opportunity I have with K through 12 educators is saying, can we pause for a second and talk about what we mean when we say the word gender? And, you know, what do we bring into the room? Well, I walk through these four components step by step. I know any of the teens in my world lose their marbles because it's so simplistic. 
um, and I'm putting a, a male and a female on each end of the line as if it's um, uh, very um, definitive in that way. I don't believe that it is at all. Um, nevertheless, I'm talking to people who absolutely say, um, if we want to know who is a man and who is a woman, we will look at their anatomical sex, their chromosomal designation, and we will make our determination. And that's that end of story. Um, except that none of us as adults are actually looking at chromosome identification card or at someone's genitals to make that determination. So then I can guide those same people into uh, an understanding of what we actually utilize. We're looking at the way someone expresses their gender. And this is my way of segueing into how children respond to that same question. How do we know if somebody's a boy or a girl? Well, boys have short hair, girls have long hair, uh, girls paint their fingernails, boys don't, and so on. And for everything that a, a kid brings up, regardless of whatever age, there's another kid in their classroom that says, Ma, no, <laughs> my aunt has really short hair and she's a girl. My cousin paints his fingernails, he's a boy. Um, one kid said, boys like to blow up things. Uh, I did not grow up as a boy. <laughs> so I, I thought, shoot, is that true? I'm trying to think really quickly, but what I've learned over time, you don't have to say a word. Uh, another kid raised her hand and said, I'm a, I like to blow up things and I'm a girl. The powerful part of this conversation is a couple, a, a couple of things. Um, children also recognize that the hair on our head is the hair on our head, whether it's short or long, that the colors that we want to wear are just colors. The toys, the activities that we want to engage in, all of that should just be something that if you have interest in playing with those toys or engaging in those activities, you should be able to do that regardless of your genital configuration. Um, and, you know, the even even talking about genitals in classrooms, I don't I don't make that happen. Um, and nor do the kids. Um, the adults, however, are, are feeling that crowding in now. That might be very um, understandable and logical to all of you. Gender identity, though, being able to introduce that concept as a person's internal sense of their own gender, um, that's the new one. And that's the one that we, we can and must incorporate into the discussion. It's the ones that the kids, um, by and large, I feel, are already on board. They don't struggle with that concept. Uh, in the same way that that we as adults might. We as adults might say, I don't even know why we need that term. Um, it's about your body, end of story again. Um, and just as a way of uh, helping adults move forward, I do talk about contemporary research that is looking at gender identity. Um, and what are the origins of gender identity? Are there, um, what are the studies showing us? Um, and they are showing correlation uh, to brain uh, to a brain gender, um, and that a potential genetic influence can be at play. Uh, I want to bring that in so that they can start thinking about it outside of the context of something very fantastical, whimsical, and juvenile. Like, oh yeah, so a kid can say just say whoever they are, and that's what works. Well, it's it's not that simple. So I hand them a um, a pathway to kind of grab a hold of, while also sharing that we don't have all the information we need. We're in the process of learning. We are incorporating understanding of gender identity and um, physiological elements of that into the discussion as we move forward. Um, sexuality on the the bottom concept. Uh, I, I bring that in only to say, we know what this is. And especially we as adults, we are thinking about this, especially you all as, uh, sex ed educators. Um, and when we bring that in, um, we can still bring that into the discussion, but we have to pull apart this gender identity piece from sexuality. And again, I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, that, that these are logical things that for you all to understand, but I'm telling you that the folks out there in the world 
are not able to extract those things yet. And they really need help and guidance to pull that apart. Uh, let's see, anything else I wanna say about this? Um, I probably spend half an hour walking through point by point and giving them specific examples so that when I say gender expression is how kids talk about gender, I give them the exact words that they use. Um, I, I talk to them about uh, the fact that kids readily can relate to gender identity as an internal sense of self, that it is not a hard co um, concept for them. So um, yeah, that is a very short strategy, uh, encapsulation of my strategy. Um, and I never do it out of order. I always start with bodies first because that's where adults go. Then I move to where kids go, gender expression. I bring the new kid in, the gender identity, and then the sexuality piece, hey, we have to pull, our, pull ourselves away from that so that we can recognize that age-appropriate discussions are, are happening. <clears throat> uh, let's see. I think, uh, yeah, well, you know what? Yeah, I'll just stop with the um, PowerPoint share. I might come back to it in a second. Um, <clears throat> That, that framework really matters and it is very simple. And I've, I've put a very simple framework in a very thick book. It took me a long time to figure out how do I, how do I share something very simple and straightforward in a way that helps any of us uh, of older generations click out of the mindset that we've been provided that has been reinforced since we were the youngest ages possible. Um, in addition to laying this out, one of my strategies is to come into the room and say, guess what? If you're hearing the word transgender and child in the same sentence, and that causes you distress, you are not alone. That is very understandable. Validation is really important for the, the fears, the concerns, the confusion, um, and whatever else shows up in the room in terms of um, keeping people listening. That's my primary goal. I want them to stay engaged in the conversation. I typically will put together a, a number of slides of things that informed my perception of gender diverse people. And those could be really ugly representations. It could be um, if anybody ever watched the film Silence of the Lambs. That representation um, is of a transgender person, no matter what way they they danced around it in the in the movie. Um, other things too that perpetuate these themes that we all might experience, whether that's themes of danger and violence, um, themes of mental illness, uh, hypersexuality or inappropriate or deviant sexuality, um, deception. Um, ridicule, revulsion. There's so many themes that run through these representations. And I, I, want, I want them to know from my perspective that I understand and that I get it. Um, so that validation again is important. Here are the things that informed me. If you're uncomfortable about this conversation, I get it. I get it. I get it. And I was there too. Um, acknowledging that those fears exist and that nobody decided to um, become angry, nobody decided to become fearful, that it is just a response to a newer situation, the newer situation being a visible presence of gender diverse kids, um, then they can say, great, I'm not alone. Even my, even my presenter is right there with me. Um, and then that helps uh, keep those that distress from being judged or them from feeling judged in that. And I'm also at the same time sharing how we're addressing a new situation. It's not that these kids, these gender diverse kids are new. We've always been around and we've been making our way, um, usually in isolation, like, like Judy mentioned. Judy said, I, I just shut my mouth. I knew never to say anything ever again because you know who wants to risk the the threat of of their the love and acceptance of their family or their peers or so forth um 
So we make room for that. We acknowledge that the new aspect of this is the visible presence and that these young people have language to describe themselves. Um, you don't need to know all the terms in the LGBTQIA plus acronym to be able to step in and say, gosh, thanks for sharing this. Um, I hear you describing yourself as agender and pansexual. Huh, I'm not familiar with those terms, but it sounds to me like you're describing your gender identity and your sexual orientation. Is that right? And right there, that adult has um, made a connection with a young person and has communicated something that says, I'm ready to hear more, even if I don't know what you're saying fully. I think that is really important. Uh, I think talking with others about research matters and it shouldn't matter. To me, when I, when I hear research supporting the, um, supporting the identities and the experiences of these students, to me, it's a no brainer. Of course we would do that. Of course we we want to um, help someone not feel internal shame or to stuff and repress, uh, to deny, to et cetera. So um, being able to bring in some of those elements of research that others need is very helpful because sometimes other people need it. Uh, one of the things I point to pretty often is the Family Acceptance Project uh, if you, they have people uh, with respect to their LGBTQIA identities, um, and they also have harmful practices. Of what to do and what not to do, um, definitely go there. I, I feel like they have a um, family acceptance project website is certainly you can go there, but there's all called lgbtqfamilyacceptance.org. Um, don't quote me, but I bet if you Googled it, you'd get pretty darn close. Uh, that is a great website to um, share with others as well. And especially with the parents and caregivers of these students that you all may encounter. Um, yeah. Let's see, what else do I wanna say? Um, I'm going to shift gears here for a second. Well, actually, before I shift, I want to say one thing. <clears throat> um, there's been times where I've second guessed myself or somebody else has said, you know what? We don't need you to outline that framework. All of our folks know the difference between gender identity, gender expression, and sexuality. Um, I will never do it again. <laughs> it take, take that advice because of what I've encountered in the room. Or... If I do, I'll do it for a moment and see how it's landing. And if it's not landing very well, boom, I'm gonna shift gears in the moment and bring it into the room. Uh, and one of the examples that comes up, uh, I heard multiple times from kindergarten teachers would be saying, um, you know, hey, I have a kid like that in my classroom every year. Uh, and so when kids might tease or bully that kid, I don't really know what to do because I'm looking at that kid and thinking he's probably gay. I can't talk about sexuality in kindergarten. And therefore that teacher zips their lips and doesn't say anything, doesn't intervene in some way because of that fear, that fear of stepping in. And, and these are things that um, even with Judy's conversation in the, in the chat that, that was brought into the mix. Um, who? You know, fear is, is a powerful force. And what that means is that kindergarten teacher does not intervene when bullying or teasing occurs. We need that teacher to do that. And guess what? The kid's five. Do we know if that kid is gay or not? We know nothing about that kid's sexuality. We know that that kid is noticeable, um, noticeably different um, from their maybe more gender typical peers. And so that could be their interests, all of those things that fall into the category of gender expression. It could be that the child is articulating a gender identity difference. 
It could be any number of things. We don't necessarily know and we don't need to know, but we do need teacher to come in and say, hey, hold on here. In our class, we treat everyone with kindness and respect. And he's wearing a skirt because that's his favorite skirt. And you don't want to be teased when you're being when you're wearing your favorite clothing. Uh, neither does he. And if you keep doing it, we have repercussions. Boom. You know, it's not making a statement about um, sexuality. It's not making a statement about being woke or on one political uh, side of the spectrum versus the other. It's just interrupting bad behavior. Um, again, I feel like some of this is often very uh, logical, but if you've got fear in the way, logic isn't the first thing to show up. Uh, I have sat with educators. I'm thinking this one room probably had 35 to 40 people and they wanted to know, hey, what do we do if a, if a kid says, Oh, you know, Joe, I, I can't believe Joey's wearing a skirt. That looks so stupid. Um, my response is you tell them to knock it off and you say, look, in our school, we treat everyone with kindness and respect, period. I watched 40 educators write down, we treat everyone with kindness and respect. They needed, they needed something very tangible to do because the brain's spinning really fast. The gay, the trans kid, the skirt on the boy, the, you know, the, all the parents of those other kids, what are you talking about with my kids? Uh, you know, it just comes crowding in. Um, okay, let's see. Said that, now I'm going to shift gears. Um, oftentimes people will ask, uh, you know, what are we required to do? Um, and that can vary across the nation. It varies across the globe. Uh, requirements are something that I'm not interested in being um, pointed to as the motivator. I want those core values about how to treat another human being to be the primary motivator. And that said, if there are protections in a particular a uh, municipality, a particular state, a particular country, great. Um, if they're not there, great. Still use the core values that uh, <laughs> by and large, most people can agree upon. Uh, for example, the Department of Education in the US under the Obama administration put out guidelines for the inclusion of transgender and um, I don't know if the word non-binary was being used at the time, but non-binary children. Spelled it out, step-by-step, -step, bathrooms, locker rooms, pronouns, names. Um, they drew from several states, uh, my, my state as well, which I was very proud to have, uh, have content find its way there. And then a few years goes by, and a new administration comes in and poof, there go the guidelines. Um, what changed in my world with the schools and the districts that I work with? Nothing, nothing changed, except that um, it's easier if you have a foundation upon which you can rely and some step-by-step -step, like, here's what you do and here's what you do and here's what you do. That's fantastic. But as far as what the schools, today's schools need, I'm getting those calls from every state, from every political leaning, um, from faith-based schools um, to schools with that are very culturally diverse. And they they all tell me, well, we're probably not your typical school community, Aiden. And I say, you're right, you're probably not. And what I find is that the questions they ask are pretty consistent. The fears that they bump up against are, are also very consistent. Um, how those questions get phrased, that's another story. Um, I've, I've found that I'm, I kind of welcome the more conservative environments because they'll put it on the table <laughs> pretty, pretty immediately, uh, meaning we can get down to it also much quicker. Um, I will also say that um, as we ponder this concept of gender identity, 
Uh, and as we pull apart these discussions for the parent community, for the adult educators, for all the adult staff members, as we pull that apart, their tension drops down. It's not necessarily that they are then waving the trans flag or the or the pride flag, but they start calming down. And I've listened to some very, you know, arms crossed and conservative people say, I didn't expect to um, feel this way that I do right now. And I see now having policy in place um, helps me with my concern. And if we have a gender inclusive policy, um, if some situations were to occur that I'm worried about, I have a pathway to address those. I have, I have administrators who can um, respond to my concerns. Fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. Um, that's what we're looking at in terms of uh, turning down the temperature. Um, I don't know how long it will take. Um, as I live and breathe every moment of my life is, is about um, trying to facilitate that temperature drop. But as Judy mentioned in the keynote, um, this is these are unprecedented times and how it will all play out and in what timeline, I don't know. Um, but nevertheless, I have lots of powerful, positive experiences that, that feed me every day and get me back in the groove. Um, so as legislative efforts happen, okay, yuck, 566 bills in, in our state legislatures, um, restricting uh, rights in some way or criminalizing supportive practices um, is deeply painful. Uh, it will cost lives and that absolutely breaks my heart. And I also have to put it in, a, in, a, in a, another bucket which is everything that elevates these conversations um, and brings us together to talk and get in dialogue, even if our voices are raised a bit, um, gets us another step closer and another step closer to greater understanding. All right, um, let's see. Um, a couple of things that show up oftentimes from educators are one is, what do we do if uh, a child tells us something about their gender identity and they tell us, do not tell my parents? We, I take a deep breath <laughs> as I step into that question. Um, and what, how I approach that question, again, I don't want to um, rely on legal mandates or the absence of them to, to dictate the responses of those teachers, of those school counselors or whomever, um, is take a second and consider the situation. Is the kid talking to you, are they seven years old? Are they 17 years old? Is the kid who's seven saying, I don't know, I just, I don't want them to know because I'm scared that they won't accept me or whatever. Is a 17 year old saying, you tell anyone and I and my mom finds out I'm on the street in a heartbeat. Bring nuance into that. You don't have to violate a kid's request, but you can step in further with that seven year old and say, well, what do you think? Um, why are you worried about this? They love you, right? Um, what do you think they might say? What are your concerns? And get them as best as they can at seven to articulate some things. Um, and then would you like some help with that? Maybe there's something that we can do to, um, to explore this in a very gentle way with your parent or caregiver. Um, that's one path. Uh, also, schools, you know, are their own entity, their own being, school, individual schools, school districts. I want the parent community to see that this school, this district is gender inclusive, that these are the steps that we are going to do 
to make sure that all of our students feel valued and included. Um, and that means honoring a name. That might mean honoring a pronoun that's being requested. What it doesn't mean is that we are making a gender identity assessment for your child. We're not doing that. That's not our job. Uh, we are creating that environment where they can feel most at most comfortable um, and optimize their learning. So being able to um, uh, make the individual school and or district a player in the equation. Uh, I don't know if that's making sense, but there, the, the district has a role as an, as an entity that is different than that of an, any individual parent. Oh, I don't want you teaching my kids about this stuff because, you know, A, B, and C. Um, you know, they're not teaching any particular thing. They're creating an environment of inclusion. And oh, by the way, that means that if a child wants to, they can share their pronouns with the other kids. And we'll honor that. No, I don't know whether your kid is transgender, non-binary, or just um, trying on a different pronoun to explore what that feels like, nor do we need to know. Those are the things that I'm I'm working with schools to um, to wrap their minds around. Now, what was the other piece? Um, the the um, this, the example of the 17 year old that was at a school where a, a kid confided in a counselor, uh, and the counselor absolutely honored that student's request for pri privacy. That student was not trying to get anyone else at all in the school to use a new pronoun, to use a, a different name, because that kid knew unequivocally that they'd be on the street if that word got out with anyone anywhere. Um, so these are kind of um, you know bookends of some variations that can occur. Say you have a 12 year old that says, I just don't want my parents to know. I think they'll be unsupportive. Um, you can again, step in and say, why do you think that? Let's talk about that a little bit. Wouldn't it be great if your parent we're on board um, and, and part of this. Um, do we see a pathway for that? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but also you don't get to go to school and have everyone know a name and a pronoun and have that in common usage. And it's not going to get back to the parents somehow. That's not realistic. Um, I wouldn't know how to do that. That's a really hefty burden that I, I can't figure out how that would be successful. Um, and so then, you know, again, if I'm a school counselor sitting down with a student, I'm gonna be talking to them about that. You know, hey, word can get back to your parent. So if it does, you know, let's map out a plan. Let's map out a strategy. Um, okay. Uh, now, I, I did mention briefly, um, political differences, faith differences, um, cultural and geographic distance, uh, differences. These all provide layered and nuanced situations and all need to be considered. Uh, as we do that, we also know that in schools, we don't need to have everyone on the same page. Um, all the families are not of the same political leanings. Um, they come from different faith back backgrounds, and some don't adhere to any particular faith. Um, cultural differences are there. The composition of one's family uh, can be quite different. Uh, some kids don't even have a, a family member looking after them. They might be in the foster care system uh, or have a um, uh, be a ward of the state in some way or be homeless. So we have to consider um, that our school environments are such that we're looking to do our best to help them all feel like they belong. Uh, and we're doing that without saying, oh, by the way, this one particular faith, since it represents, you know, the, the, the faith of the, that's shared with the principal, that's the one we're going to elevate. No, those, those administrators recognize that they have a different responsibility. So oftentimes I will talk to uh, a teacher or a principal. And if somebody comes in and says, hey, what are you teaching my kid? This does not align with our family's faith values. You can say, number one, I so appreciate you coming in. 
uh, and sharing this with me. This conversation is really important. I imagine it might've been a little nerve wracking to even think about doing it. So I just wanna thank you for putting this on the table and your family's faith values are really truly important. We're not trying to get in the way of that. So please do have those conversations with your child at the dinner table or, or whenever. Um, and know that what we're doing here, again, is creating an environment where all the kids feel welcome, independent of um, whatever particular faith background. That positions that administrator or teacher, um, not as a person who is pushing a particular agenda or not, but as a person who has responsibility responsibility for the entire school community. Um, yeah, so how about that? Easier said than done. <laughs> um, and that that moves us to uh, some of the, the practical ways all of this plays out. The bathrooms, the locker rooms, the ways we separate kids by gender for any number of things. Um, the sports conversation is shot way up to the top of the list. Uh, and these these variables are uh, mm, they're so concisely regurgitated um, that if you don't know, you need to know that they're being packaged up by others and distributed out to the broader community. Um, they are not. Desi these questions are not designed to be conversation starters. They're designed to be conversation stoppers. So one example of that is, well, we can't have transgender girls participating in girls or women's sports. Now, can we? They will have an unfair physical advantage. Um, they will take away scholarship opportunities from other girls. They will um, take the, uh, a, a place on a team uh, from another girl. They will break all of the records and the other girls will not be able to compete. Those are, while it, it might be initially framed as a question, those are statements um, that are put forth as if, boom, solidly true. And for most people, um, they might have that sense themselves. Um, and I get that because you know what? I've grappled with those questions too. Like, what does that mean? Is that true? Um, there's a lot to discuss there. And stepping into sports conversations is uh, really crucial. And we can recognize that what we talk about in uh, K through fifth grade might be different than sixth through eighth, might be different than ninth through twelfth, and can certainly be different than college level and professional level athletics. So let's go ahead and bring those variables into the discussion and consider. Now, I happen to be, uh, have done work in Washington state with respect to establishing the state or the nation's first gender inclusion policy for K through 12 students. That was 17 plus years ago. So I, I think we can ask these questions, but why don't we actually stop and take a look and say, how's it going? How is this playing out? Are they breaking records? Um, are they taking opportunities away from other kids? What is, what is the response and reactions of their teammates? In 17 years time, one case, one student's participation, a, a young high school age track, uh, track team member, transgender girl, uh, her case came up re for review as to whether she was eligible to participate. Um, what came out of that was her teammates wrote a letter in support. Her coach showed up to the review to advocate for her. The poor girl was terrified um, and everyone recognized they should never put a student through that again. And they also, this review team, which I was uh, also fortunate to be part of, we recognized that there was no other situation where a student would have to defend their eligibility status because an external school challenged it. If that child's school determined that they were eligible, how can somebody else then come in and, and protest? Um, so the cool thing about that um, particular situation, you know, my hope is, is that, that provided that 
student with some uh, courage and um, confidence, at least after the fact, but also the athletics governing body had to go back to the table and say, we got to change this. We can't have these students needing to defend themselves. Uh, we, we should change our language because there's a lot of kids talking about their term non-binary and using that to describe themselves. Our teams are still largely gendered, boys and girls. So where do we have them participate? Uh, so, so that process that showed up 15 years later, fantastic. Let's take a look and see what's working. What isn't working? Do we need to adjust? And why can we not have that approach for the next 15 years and the next 15 years? We can imagine a lot of scenarios, which is what people spend a lot of time doing. Um, and those scenarios, by and large, are not playing out. Um, what is playing out? Well, as, as is evidenced by that example, uh, a student is being put on the hot seat um, and dealing with uh, the uh, fears of others, it personally embodying the fears of those others. To, and having to defend herself. Um, now, even, even since then, I've come back with the same activities association folks, and they're talking to me about the numbers. How many trans students are there in the state of Washington? Well, they said maybe somewhere 50 to 80 students. Okay, how many student athletes in the entire state? 200,000. We're talking less than half a percent, and less than half a percent of those Less than half of those are trans girls. How are they doing? What are their stats? Um, you know what? They're competing right along with their peers. They're winning, they're losing. Uh, so let's talk about the realities versus the imagined scenarios. Uh, that's just one example of those questions that get tossed out. Um, what happens if? So um, a couple other things, and then I wanna hear from all of you, if I may. Uh, is there anything else here? Um, I used the sports example because that, that one is ramped up, but you know, five or six years ago, it was everyone was uh, throwing their hands up about bathrooms. Um, the, the target keeps shifting. And I think partly it keeps shifting because again, as it elevates and we look at it and we talk about solutions, those solutions are there. Um, and then the fear isn't. I wonder, personally, I wonder, oh, we're um, just about a year away from a presidential election. How's the dialogue going to change once that critter is over? Um, I don't know, um, but I suspect that it will change pretty significantly. And now we have a lot of these bills moving through legislatures, um, some of them passing, many of them not. The ones that are passing going through multiple legal challenges. What's the Supreme Court going to do? You know what? I don't know. But I can tell you what they did in 2020. They had three cases that they grouped together and examined to um, consider whether uh, these were employment cases uh, as to whether sexuality or gender identity constituted discrimination based on sex. Um, I think two of the plaintiffs were gay, identified as gay, and one was uh, transgender. And they grouped them together and that court weighed in and said, yes, that is discrimination based on sex. Okay, well, was that a, a really um, the more liberal court justices prevailing uh, in a 5-4 split? No, <laughs> it was the conservative justices in a 6-3 split. That gave me a lot of hope. You know, are they going to do, uh, are they going to weigh in in certain ways again? I don't know. Um, but nevertheless, here's the here's the final. Uh, I'll say penultimate because it's I know it's never the last thing I'm going to say. But how about a penultimate, which is these kids are in every community, gender diverse kids, kids of different differing um, orientations. Uh, they're in every community, and what I try to give back to those particular communities that I'm stepping into is saying these are your children. I don't have a, a, an agenda for them. If they're transgender, what I want is for you to love and support them. If they decide they're not transgender, what I want you to do is love and support them. I really work to give it back to them and say, please look after your own children. 
Um, and, and here are some ways that, that you can do that. Any thoughts, folks, about um, any of that? Yeah, we have about four questions so far, and it's been a lovely chat with lots of some great resource sharing. So is it okay if I, I start to share those questions with you? You bet. Okay, great. The first one is, um, Aiden, if you have time, can you speak to your perspectives um, or your perspective about the validity or non-validity of transmedicalism and what you suggest for approaching this topic with youth? Oh, transmedicalism. Um, I'd probably have to know a little bit more about what you're getting at with that. Um, is that um, targeting trans uh, medically affirming care or? Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Yes, please go. Hi. Um, my name is Sade. Um, Aiden, thank you so much for being here with us. And um, I'm happy to just provide a little more context. So my understanding of I'm a trans person myself, I'm, I identify as non binary, I'm on testosterone, and I learned about trans medicalism on the internet. But I understand that trans medicalism is um, kind of it's it's the concept that being trans is a medical issue, or kind of like a, a a mental condition or something that can be that can be perceived through neuroimaging and understanding the brain and the structure of the brain or the body. Um, and it it particularly argues that you have to experience dysphoria in order to be um, to be you know, accurately categorized as trans. So I was just curious, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a budding sex educator. I work with lots of trans kids all the time and I would really value your perspective here. So thank you. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go back to what I said at the beginning about being a bridge. So um, that means that I, I might answer it in several different ways, depending on who's asking the question. So you, my friend, asking that of me as a tra trans person, non-binary person, one, one to another, I'm gonna say, we don't need that. We don't need it to be medicalized. We don't need to classify it as a mental health challenge. Um, it's a societal challenge. Uh, and people often will ask, hey, uh, if we could remove gender stereotypes and expectations um, from society, um, would people need to actually go through a gender transition, uh, a medical, met take medical steps? Well, guess what? I'm busy being human first and foremost. So it's very difficult for me to even imagine what that might, how that might even be possible. But if I stretch my brain really hard and think, huh, I wonder if that would be possible. Um, I think, yeah, actually, I think less people would take a, need to take a medical route. Um, but how do we, how do we, how do we get seen and heard and validated for who we are? Well, people need to see it. They need that proof. They need to see my beard. Um, they need to um, they need to know that uh, somebody is taking these steps to make it look good and right for them. Now, I'm not a, I'm not passionate about that at all. Um, I don't want that at all. I want a world where any of us can make the choices that we need and want to make um, to op best optimize our experience. So, you know, that's one piece. Um, you know, personally speaking, when I started my path, I landed on a place where, where when I looked at the mirror, I saw the person that I was. I was like, oh, there you are, finally, finally, finally. So the two factors that I pursued were chest surgery um, and then also about a year or so on testosterone. And I loved what I saw. I still had my long hair. Um, I felt pretty hot, <laughs> you know, it's quite, quite a number of years ago. Um, and you know what I couldn't deal with? Everybody else. People were losing it. I, you know, a, a, a police officer got mad at me, pulled me over for a blinker being out, got mad at me by looking at my ID because what he saw on the gender marker didn't match what he perceived in me personally. I had people hollering things across the street. I had people coming up to me asking, you know, what are you? Um, show me, trying to drag me into a bathroom. Show me your stuff. You know, just the distress was so high. And I was so, so disappointed because I finally saw somebody looking back 
from the mirror and and knowing like ah oh, there you are and knowing that if i did that then then i would deal with all types of distress around me daily moment by moment and dangers and that's being white <laughs> so um you know i'm disappointed and in the world as at large and i made choices and those choices um have pluses and minuses uh and so in some respects that's anyone's life journey that was over 25 years ago i think anybody can look back and and potentially as they get older and think oh i was so much younger and healthier and you know, whatever at that time, why didn't I do A, B, and C then? And we might have a little bit of grief with the aging process. Okay, well, it's not so different with me. I've just thrown an extra gender element into it. Um, but here's the other thing. Look at this. You know, the grayness and the beard, all of that. Um, me showing up at five feet, six inches tall in a room. I am I am masculine in my presentation, and I'm also not threatening there's so many things that show up with this presentation that facilitates my work to an effective end. And so I use it to effect the change that I want so that the next person that sees themselves in the mirror gets to be there if that's where they want to be. Um, I feel like there's one other thing I want to say in that. And what the heck is it? Um, oh, I know. I'm an identical twin. I have a twin sister. Is nature, uh, is gender nature based or nurture based? Well, I don't know. And I will never know. I spent 10 years of my life wanting some answers, um, wanting to know more about that research that points to uh, correlating areas in the brain or looking at uh, genetic um, connection or whatever. And I just thought, you know what? I got a life to live. And maybe my sister will come along someday and maybe she won't. I mean, so far she's not doing it. Where is gender? You know what? I think gender is beautiful. Um, I think it's amazing. I think it's layered and complex. I think it's fluid. I think we can do whatever we want with it. Um, and I'm trying to move people forward and I've got to start with a very simple framework. I've got to start with where they are to be able to get them to go, gosh, but I don't, maybe like gender feels really elusive. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. So I, I think um, the answer is there's, there's benefits to the medicalization of it that can move the needle forward, but I sure don't want the needle staying there. How's that? That is, um, that is incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you All so right. much. Yeah, absolutely. Nora, what else do we have? Yeah, absolutely. We have about uh, just under four minutes left. So the next question was, what about comments from high school students that have learned more of society's stereotypes about gender and sexuality? And we also had a comment in the chat about someone struggling with anti-trans comments, particularly coming from middle school students. And like, you know, those are the trusted adults in their lives. So any recommendations for folks in those grade bands? More than, I have way more to say than can be done in the amount of time that we have, but I put a lot of that in this book. So grab that book and dig in. And here's some of the things that you'll find, which are, you know, high school students are forming opinions. Um, they're finding their voices. They're weighing in on different issues. Uh, and they're being informed oftentimes by their families, uh, the communities in which they belong. Um, and they're playing those things out. They're playing those um, differences out in the, in the schools. Um, and those, those challenges, those do debates, those insensitive um, uh, and, and just cruel engagement with others. I need and want the adults in those environments to act and to stop it, not to stop the conversation, because there can be a structured conversation where there's rules of engagement, respectful engagement, 
um, and, and any particular issue could be discussed. What a valuable tool to present to students. So why not stru structure that? You don't get to cut somebody down. If you wanna argue a point, argue a point. And there can be rebuttal and there can be, you know, a, a basic debate club rules could be could be employed. Um, that's that's one thing. Um, I feel like I missed a piece there in the question. What was this? There was a second part of the question. Yeah. Specific to middle schoolers, like hearing this from trusted adults and then repeating it back in school, how to manage that like mm -hmm. toxicity it sets up. Uh, we start, uh, this is not quite a direct answer, but we have to start in kindergarten or pre-K. Um, if we start bringing in differences and, and including gender and sexuality differences in those conversations at age appropriate levels, it's, then it's not a new conversation. But again, that kid, that gay kindergartner, if you've got that teacher that freezes up, because, because that teacher considers that kid gay simply because he decided to wear a skirt that day, then you're kicking the can down the road. Uh, and okay, so fantastic. What, we're gonna talk about that at eighth grade? Well, by that time, that kid has had some hardcore bullying and he is the target for many years. A conversation in a health ed class isn't gonna remedy that. We need to talk about gender identity differences and gender expression differences at those youngest ages possible. And that's what I feed back to educators over and over. If it, if it helps take off anatomical sex, if it helps take off sexual, sexuality, um, I'm, not, I'm not arm wrestling people on every topic possible, but if you wanna know how to step in with kids and get conversations happening right now, then let the kids talk about their families, let the kids talk about their identities and their experiences um, and do them in supportive ways, uh, respectful and kind ways. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Great advice. And I can't recommend highly enough to grab Aiden's book from your bookseller of choice. Um, such incredible wisdom and experience. Thank you so much for sharing this with us tonight. Shirley has put in the chat Aiden's email if folks want to follow up with him directly. I know there were some folks interested in reaching out and apologies for the questions we didn't quite get a chance to grab, um, but I know there'll be more, more chance to interact with 